Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the 2017-2018 national budget. Uh, Bernie, can you first slide, please? Fiscal update. Uh, this is the uh, deficit of the budget. As you can see on the top, is, uh, we have only one blue line pointing on top. That line across is zero. Anything below that is the actual deficit. Is that the first slide? Yeah. Okay. Um, anything below that is the deficit. All governments in Fiji, right from the Ratumara government days, right up till now, have always run a uh, deficit. Because we're a developing country. As you know, that uh, developing countries, even countries like Canada, Singapore, they all run deficits. Uh, government generally tends to borrow to be able to build. More so developing countries. As you know, that uh, you know, when the colonial governments were there, you'll see where they live, they'll have water and electricity, but the rest of the country did not. So we actually have to build, of course, around the infrastructure to be able to do that. The trick, of course, is, sorry, I don't have the, the, um, the, the, the pointer, but the trick, of course, is to ensure that the blue line does not get too long going downwards. This blue line does not get too long going downwards. Um, we have a policy, as you can see, we want to reduce deficit. Things like cyclones actually create bigger deficits. So that's why we don't like cyclones. Cyclone kills people. It damages sewage pipes, water pipes, roads, bridges, jetties, and schools. So you need money to build it. Now, I'll tell you later on, and hopefully they put all the slides there, um, that we actually have been making what they call an operating surplus. So because we're making an operating surplus, we actually have to borrow less. But we also have a very big rebuild program and also have a huge infrastructure program. So I'll talk to you also about debt uh, later on. But this is what deficit is all about. You know, so when I stand up in parliament and say, we have a 3% deficit. This is what we're talking about in terms of how much money we make and how much money we spend for that year. That's what a deficit is all about. Okay, next one, please. Okay, go total government revenue. So in 2004, the government made a revenue of $1.1 billion. Today, we're making a revenue of $3.8 billion. So as a government, we're making more money. Whether it is through um, more tourists coming in, paying VAT, or through the environmental levy, or whether now we're getting, going after people who should be paying tax and weren't paying tax. As you know, that recently, as we announced, one supermarket alone has been recently assessed to pay $53 million. One supermarket chain alone. There's lots of them out there. Uh, there's a lot of dodgy dealings that are going on, so we're actually strengthening FERCA to be able to go after the big guys to be able to collect more revenue. But of course, collecting revenue, we're also being very tight about how we manage our finances. So total revenue basically has tripled uh, since 2004, which means we have to borrow less. And when we have more revenue, we can give you a bigger pay rise too. We can do things like what that lady is talking about, you know, being able to recognize those things. So at the moment, for example, we're looking at meal allowances. At the moment, it's $9. We're looking at increasing meal allowances also. Next one, please. Total government expenditure in infrastructure, development, health, education, access to justice, and social protection. We put this together, all these key areas, we're showing to you over here how much money we spend. So if you take the infrastructure spend, health, education, access to justice, social protection, $1.3 billion was spent in 2004, now we're spending $4.3 billion. As you can see, there's been some substantial increases. Over here, of course, we had free education coming in. Free education, of course, costs money. Uh, and that adds to the cost in terms of education. Of course, now you've got the pay rise. I mean, to do the overall pay rise, you're looking at about $142 million overall. So you may think that, okay, I'm getting a $3,000 pay rise. When you put everybody's pay rises together, it's about $145 million more in respect of that. So um, infrastructure development, as you know, roads, bridges, jetties, electricity. Before, if you lived in, lived in a rural area, you wanted to be connected to the FEA grid, you had to give a 10% contribution. Now you no longer require a 10% contribution. Same thing with water. Uh, health, of course. Health is a big issue for us because there's a lack of specialists in Fiji. There are also not enough doctors graduating every year to fill in the gap. We don't have enough doctors graduating. The doctors have received about an 80% pay rise overall in the past uh, 18 months or so. 
they are of course being reviewed again. You know, you cannot, for example, get somebody who's done MBBS, we're talking about qualifications, somebody's done MBBS and expect them to cut you open and play around with your heart and do open heart surgery. They can't do that. In order to get an open heart surgeon, you need them to be trained for 10, 15 years. You need to send them overseas. We have one Dr. Biribo, he's been sent, we sent him to New Zealand. He's now come back as the only neurosurgeon in Fiji. So there are certain surgeries that are now being done in Fiji for neurological sur surgeries that was never done before. But it takes time. It's taken him a few years to get trained. So our health system is actually strangled by the fact there's not enough personnel and we have to actually now invest in the HR where there's no investment in, in HR. Education, of course, speaks for itself. Access to justice, as you would know now that all major towns and cities, including places like Nambuwalu, Tavuni, now Kandavu, Rotuma, um, Ovalau, they all have legal aid officers or are about to get legal aid officers. So we believe, as provided for in the Constitution, that just because you are poor, it does not mean you should not get access to legal aid. So generally at the moment, we do legal aid has been expanded services, not just criminal matters, but family law matters, maternity, domestic violence, and also for people to write wills. They write your wills, they do your probate for you if you earn below, uh, you know, earn below a particular income level. So we've got access to your justice. Social protection, as you know, social welfare payments have, been, have increased. We're now giving social welfare protection specifically now for uh, disabled people. We have this scheme also, you know, uh, some of you have worked in rural areas. Many people who, uh, in Fiji, who may have lived in the village all their life, may have been a cane farmer all their life, or farmer, whatever the case may be, lived in a rural area, they've never worked for anybody. They've only worked for themselves. Catch fish, sell dalo, cut cane, whatever it is, or plant cane. So they don't have actually FNPF. Many of these people are now old. So they don't actually have a pension. Unlike all of you, when you retire, you'll have a pension. These people don't have a pension. And we see society is changing. There are many young people who no longer look after their parents. They migrated or they, you know, the disconnectivity is there. So we started a few years ago that those people over the age of 70 who never had FNPF, we started giving them $30 a month. Then we reduced it to 68, brought it to 50, and as announced in the budget now, anybody over the age of 65 that's never had FNPF will get $100 a month. Uh, is, is pension. We know both husband and wife will be able to get that. And there are many people caught under that, but also disability. So this is the amount of money we spend, about $4.3 billion. There are things like, I mean, those of you who may be from the West or you go to the West, if you look at the four-lane road that's done in Nandi, is that if you see, there's no overhead cables. It costs us about $20, $25 million more to put the cables underground. Now, why have we done that is because next time there's a cyclone, there's nothing to blow down. When we had Cyclone Winston, 6,000 kilometers of electrical cables went down. Now we put those poles up with the cables up. Next time there's a cyclone, it'll go down again. So this is what you call building resilience. There's also a, a common feature we found that most of the roads that were built in Fiji previously, you say this was the road, they put the water pipe underneath the road also. So the water pipes like in Suva is about 50, 60 years old, 50 to 60 years old. Some of them actually used to have asbestos in it too. So when there's a water leakage, because the pipe has, you know, is old, and a lot more people are using this pressure in the pipes, the joints expand, there's a water leakage. We don't know about it, but we say, hey, this road is not good. There's so many potholes. Then eventually you find out, so you dig up the road to fix up the pipe, but the road is not fixed. So what we've done with the Nandi, the four-lane road, we've taken out the water pipes, put it on the side of the road. Electrical cables, taken it from there, put it down there. It costs more money, but in the long term, it's cheaper. Because if you build now, it's a lot more cheaper to do it if you were to do it you know, later on. So, you know, people talk about expenditure and infrastructure. Our argument is that if we spend it now, you don't have to do it later. So you spend less later. We've done a four-lane road in now in Nandi. That can hold us now for the next 30 years. You know, there won't be that much traffic. Traffic is growing, but still, it'll cater for that. Whether you're building, you know, road in number one, Draketi, etc. Next one, please. Please tell me if I'm going too fast. If you've got questions, let me know. Now, this is very interesting. This is a very, very important slide. What this shows is the difference between operating and capital expenditure. So every year, like your school, when your school will have a budget. So most of your expenditure would be operating expenditure. In other words, what are the things you spend money just to simply run the school on a day-to-day -day basis? 
So you pay for the teacher's salary, you pay for the electricity, you run the fan, you pay for your cleaners, whatever it is. That's your operating cost. But when you put up a building, a new classroom, that's what you call a capital expenditure. So for governments, we, when we spend money, we should be focusing more on spending money on capital. Because if we, in particular if you're borrowing money, if you borrow money, you should borrow money to build, not borrow money to spend now and you have nothing to show for it next year. The, in the student uh, budget consultations, I used to say to them, the example I used was that if you all decided now to have a big party at McDonald's and we go to ANZ and borrow money because we don't have any money and they give us a loan, we all go to McDonald's, spend the money, eat the burgers, drink the Coke or whatever it is. Next morning we wake up, the Coke and the burgers are gone, but the debt is still there. But if we went to the bank and borrowed money to build something, the debt will be there next day, the building will be there, after a while the debt will go, but the building will remain. So, if you look at the permutation, expenditure mix, 2004, 83% of that year's budget went into operating expenditure, only 17% went into capital expenditure. In other words, they had only 17% to show for it. This is why we have to, what we call, play catch up with infrastructure. If you look at it today, only 59% goes into operating expenditure, but 41% goes into capital expenditure. So how have we done that? We have, of course, raised our revenue, but we're becoming a bit stingy. You have to run, you know, make sure there's proper accountability. So the money is spent a lot more wisely. So, for example, most of the government vehicles now, we don't actually buy the vehicles. We lease the vehicles. So when you lease the vehicles, when you buy a vehicle, it may cost you $90,000. You know, four-wheel drive, say $90,000, $100,000. If you buy 100 of those, you can imagine what the cost would be, and you have to pay upfront. When you lease the vehicles, you pay about a quarter of the price or less of that. You just pay it on a recurring basis. After three or four years, we return the vehicle. Somebody buys a second-hand vehicle, and we get a new vehicle. So it reduces our capital outlay. So those are some of the things that we are doing in respect of reducing our operating costs, but also giving more money for building. It's very important, this part here. Next, please. Okay, education. This is the amount of money we spend in education. <coughs> so, um, comparison, 2004 was $270 million went into education. Now we're spending $964 million this year's budget. Out of the 964, you can take out 170 for the rebuild, but the rest of it goes towards free education, uh, tertiary education loan, of course, the loan scheme, the topper scheme, and of course, increased allowances, and of course, your salaries will also go into that too. That's how much money we're giving to the education sector. We see that as an investment. Because in reality, the economy is growing well at the moment, and I'll show that hopefully the slide is there, but we can lose the momentum if we don't have the right qualified people to take advantage of it. You know, at the moment, I remember in the school students, uh, most common complaint was they said, we don't have professional student counselors in our schools. Most of the high school students complained. And uh, they said some of our teachers double up as counselors, and we don't like it because they're not very good. Some said that they are good, and I said, yes, we recognize that. That's a problem. Then I asked them the question. I said, how many of you want to pursue professional counseling as a career? Nobody. Nobody put their hands up. Because you see, it's the value systems. No parent goes to their daughter or their son and says, I want you to become a professional counselor. They all say, I want you to become a doctor, lawyer, engineer, teacher, whatever it is. So we don't even have a speech therapist. There's only one speech therapist in Fiji at the Frank Hilton College or school. That's why we gave the Frank Hilton School uh, about uh, $800,000 or $900,000 this year for them to actually go to hospitals and make that intervention. Because when babies are born, they may have a speech impediment, they may have a hearing problem, but if you intervene at the right time, you can solve their problem. So the productive capacity of that individual increases. So these are the kind of things we need. We need more qualified people within our system. We don't have enough town planners. We don't even have enough surveyors. We don't even have marine, even enough marine scientists, foresters. People are selling crabs this size by the side of the road and all of you go and buy it too. <laughs> That's a problem. Huge problem in the ecosystem. Huge problem in our sustainability in 
you know, getting money for the villagers from the, this sort of source of income. So this is why we're investing in it. And uh, that's how much money we spend. If you have any questions, you can ask me. That's where, it, that's where the money goes. Next one, please. I don't know if you know that, but uh, just go back, please. You know, we've now given greater flexibility in tells. Before, if you receive tells and you fail a subject, to repeat the subject, you did not get tells. Now we've allowed for that. So if a student fails a subject, now we allow them to get tells again for that subject. But only once. We don't want to repeat twice. Only once we can do that. Also, there are some students when they go to university, say they may start doing accounting and HR. Then they decide they don't want to do that. They want to do, you know, I don't know, something economics or maybe accounting and IT. So TELS did not allow you to change courses before. Now we allow you to change courses once. We've also allowed another thing is that before TELS was only relevant for students who completed year 13. Now we allow students who do year 12 to get TELS if they go and do specific engineering courses at FNU. There are certain engineering courses at FNU that accept students after year 12. So we've allowed for that too. And we've increased the allowances for students. So now students who get TELS uh, and also toppers, they get their allowances during the holidays because obviously if I come from Lambasa and rent a house in, in Suva, I, need to get, I still need to pay my rent during the holidays. So we actually give them the allowance to cover their rent during the holidays uh, also. Next one, please. Budget education. Um, this is what we've given. Uh, Ministry of Education itself receives 490. University of South Pacific, 30, this is all million dollars, please. Uh, 30, actually that should be 59. University of Fiji, 3.4, 2.4 others. These are like Corpus Christi, uh, Montfort Boys Town, etc. They get that. Uh, Swami, uh, the Sangam Nursing College, uh, these people get that money there. And this is what we get for toppers, uh, existing scholarships, etc. So $964 million. Next, please. Uh, funding for roads, bridges, and jetties. I mean, it speaks for itself. Good old PWD days. You got $55 million. Uh, now you get $528 million. And a lot of it is to do with the rebuild. A lot of it is to do with building better infrastructure. This also includes the loans. So we build the Tassil, the road from Nambuwal to Draketi. That cost us over $200 million, of course. So the loan repayments are all factored in and the uh, disbursements in that. Next, please. Water and energy, similar thing. Um, increased investment in water. You know, we give water tanks. A lot more people connected to that. Uh, rural electrification. We also give electricity. So those people who earn less than $30,000 a year, the household that earns less than $30,000 a year, we subsidize your electricity. Half of your tariff rate we pay. So the tariff cost for this in a household is $0.34 cents a unit. So we pay $0.17 cents on your behalf to FEA. Any, people, any household earning less than $30,000 a year. Now, there's one adjustment we made. A lot of people don't know about this. Before this budget, if you were a household that earned less than $30,000 a year, and if you used 95 kilowatts or less, then only we'd subsidize you. So if you use 97, we won't give you a single cent. So now we've adjusted it. So now we've brought it up to 100. So even if you use 120, will still pay for the subsidy rate up to 100, in, uh, 100 kilowatts. So it's a lot more expensive now. So if you know, uh, those of you who live in communities where people don't know, please you need to tell them that. Households that earn uh, less than $30,000 a year, they're also entitled to 90,250 liters of free water a year through WEF, and they can also apply for that, and they, uh, they can get that too. Next, please. Uh, this is funding for health. Um, as you can see that... Uh, I mean, health is obviously getting now more, 388, a lot of it used to, for uh, salaries, etc. Uh, we also building, like Makoi is getting a new maternity hospital, we're building one uh, subdivisional hospital in Kayasi and various of the outer places too, we you know, giving better services too, so there's pressure on the metropolitan areas. Next one, please. Uh, this is what I talked about. So this is how much revenue we make, operating revenue, all the way from there to there. That's the blue line. This is how much we spend in operating expenditure. So I'm here, my staff are here, our salaries, their salaries, the fuel that we use to come in the car, all of that, the, that meal that they prepared for you, 
that's all operating expenditure. Toilet paper, photocopying paper, all of that, that's operating expenditure. So after we spend from our operating revenue, our operating expenditure, we make this much savings. So now we save about uh, $896 million. That's how much savings we have. We can do the comparison and see that. Now when we have greater savings, it means we have to borrow less to build. That's basically what it is. We have to borrow less to build. Next one, please. Okay, government debt. A lot of people talk about government debt without necessarily knowing about government debt. Um, this is the line to be concerned about. This is what you call your debt to GDP ratio. This is what you call the nominal sum of debt. So, I'll give you an example. Uh, the debt that we have here, 5.2 billion, 2.2 billion of that was inherited from the previous governments because obviously whichever government comes in, they have to honor the debt of the previous government. And thankfully, Fiji has never defaulted on any of its loans. Through all governments, we've never defaulted on any of the loans. So about 2.2 or 2.3 billion is debts of previous government, and that obviously keeps on accumulating. And then, of course, we've incurred new debt. Now, the example that I use with the students is this. Assuming our GDP, our GDP like our total wealth value, is $100, and we go out and borrow $20. So you would say your debt to GDP ratio is 20%, right? 20 of 100 is 20%. Then our wealth increases to $500. Then we go and borrow $50. So even though we borrowed more, nearly two and a half times more than what we borrowed originally, our debt to GDP ratio is only 10%. Do you get my drift? You see what I'm talking about? Because as your income increases, your ability to borrow, borrow the nominal sum increases also. So this is what's happened here. So I'll give you an example. You see, in 2006, the debt was $2.8 billion. But debt to GDP ratio is 53.3%. Today, the debt is $5.2 billion, but debt to GDP ratio is 47.5%. So in other words, even though in nominal terms you borrowed more, as a debt to GDP ratio, your debt is actually coming down in the debt to GDP ratio method. And I'll give you an example. There's, I'll, I'll show you a slide too. The debt to GDP ratio of Canada is 92%. Ours is only 47%. The debt exposure is about $1.2 trillion. But nobody says Canada is a failed state or it's a bankrupt state. It depends on the capacity, the productive capacity of the country. Next slide, please. Okay, this is some comparisons. Debt to GDP ratio. Japan is 239.2% debt to GDP ratio. Something, some trillion dollars debt. US is 107. Now, let's look at comparable countries. Maldives, Seychelles, Nauru, Mauritius. Fiji City at 45.8, if you look at the last year's statistics. I went to Mauritius. Uh, beginning of this year. Very interesting country. Similar to Fiji, they, their GDP was less than ours in the 1960s. They made some very decisive changes to the economy. They also similarly it was sugar-based country, but now all the sugarcane farms are only owned by six companies. In Fiji we have small farmer holdings. They have only six companies that own all the sugarcane plantations. But they decided a few years ago, like what we are doing now, but they did it a lot earlier than us and more extensively, they decided to just massively invest in roads, bridges, electricity. Unlike Fiji, they don't even have a river. They've created a dam to hold water. That's why Mauritius does not actually have any, it never had any indigenous people because nobody survived there. So the, what actually happened was they invested in that because they decided strategically they are very close to Africa, but is removed from Africa. So they enticed all the ITC companies, all the IT companies, sorry. So they set up an IT park. The government put all the hardware, the infrastructure in it. And they said, you can service Africa using Mauritius. So you have all the multinational companies are now based in Mauritius to serve Africa. They went into partnership with Indian hospitals. They set up three hospitals. So all the Africans, when they want sophisticated surgeries, they go to Mauritius for surgery. They don't have to go all the way to Europe or India. That's how they position themselves. So their debt actually went up high. Their debt at the moment is about six billion US dollars. 
Our debt in US dollars is 2 billion US dollars, about 2 billion US dollars. But so even though their debt is quite high compared to ours, they're making lots of money. So the point being, if you actually invest in an area that will give you more money, then it's a good way to spend money. The simple example that I use is that the, the, the villager who sells the fish or the fisherman who sells the fish on the side of the road and they don't have electricity, you drive past, they sell fresh fish. By the afternoon time, if they don't sell the fish, he has to, he has to actually reduce the price of the fish or he eats it himself. He's probably sick and tired of eating fish or the fish goes bad. The moment you give him or her electricity, they don't bring down the price. Then they'll keep the uh, fish in the fridge. Next morning, they'll put it out, throw water on it. You drive past a fresh fish for sale. <laughs> but his income level has increased. Only reason why his income level is increased is because he has access to electricity. So if you connect people to electricity for productive capacity, then obviously you're increasing the productive capacity, you increase the revenue of people. So that's what they've done. So, you know, by comparison, you can see all the other countries. I mean, like Australia's debt to GDP ratio is less than ours, but in terms of nominal terms, it's obviously a lot higher than ours. So ours is two billion, that'd be like, you know, 20, 30 billion dollars, but debt to GDP ratio is lower. Next, please. Our major revenue policies, what have you done? As we said, we've increased the income tax threshold from 16 to 30,000. Uh, this dividend tax is removed. Uh, this does not apply to you. Uh, we've we've uh, changed the environmental levy. Uh, it used to be called environmental levy. It's now called the environment and climate adaptation levy or called ECAL. So if you go and eat at some small cafeteria, you don't pay ECAL. But if you go and eat at a fancy restaurant in Denarau, you'll pay ECAL. If you go and watch a movie at Village 6 or Live Cinema, you'll pay ECAL. So it's targeted at what we call those areas that is not your day-to-day -day use. You hire a rental car, you'll pay ECAL, right? Because that's not your everyday. You don't, when you sit in a bus, you don't pay ECAL. When you go and uh, stay in a hotel, you'll pay ECAL. Now, one of the interesting things we've done with ECAL, we actually moved a new law, and we said that any money collected from ECAL, we have to only spend it in environmental and climate adaptation measures, but more so, now by law, we have compelled ourselves to make it public as to how that money has been spent. So we have to put out diagrams at the airport, etc., and you know, give out public information where that money has gone to. So last year, under the environmental levy, we collected about $70 million. We expect to collect with ECAL about 85 to $90 million. As you would have seen in today's papers, a lot more tourists coming through. So the tourist also does not mind paying ECAL. We say, I'm contributing to the environment. It's a psychological thing. So what we did was, last year the environmental levy was 6%. This time around it's 10%, but we've reduced the service turnover tax from 10 to for 6. From 10 to 6. So it has actually a nil effect, but the tax rate remains the same. But we've given more money for that. Next one, please. I mean, these are some of the things that we've done. We've reduced duty on fabricated steel. There's a lot of construction going on. You know, the construction industry in Fiji is very interesting at the moment. We have a shortage of skill sets in the tradespeople. We have construction companies now bringing in tradespeople from Bangladesh, from Philippines, from Indonesia. You'll see them on some of the work sites because we don't have good tradespeople. You know, like, okay, laying the tile over here is different to laying the tile, say, in a hotel. The shortage of people. We have welders in Suva, people who do welding getting paid $16, $17 an hour. People who are laying bricks in construction sites are being paid $7, $8 an hour. I get so many complaints from uh, construction companies saying, can you pass a law? I said, well, what's wrong? He said, I've hired these guys, they're laying bricks in my building, and then next day I came, they weren't there. I said, what happened? He said, oh, the guy down the road is paying them a dollar fifty more an hour. <laughs> because there's so much fluidity, because there's a shortage of people. Electricians are being paid $12, $13 an hour because of a huge demand. That's why the technical colleges are, are, are good for us. So we've actually reduced duty in many of these things to help the construction industry. Uh, all of this will relate to that. Uh, next one, please. Again, you know, we've done things for, I don't know if you want to know about taxi people, uh, taxi drivers, bus operators. We've given them a number of concessions. 
in inter-island shipping. We want more maritime you know, shipping. So zero rated duty on spare parts for them, zero rated duty on anybody wanting to bring a new vessel in. These are the kind of things that we're doing unlocking. So you know, things like with taxi permits. I know some teachers have taxi permits. So, you know, um, at the moment, so what we've made the announcement, if you have a taxi permit from the 1st of October, you automatically get a taxi permit for 10 years. Automatically. Because at the moment, you only get a taxi permit for three years. Now, you don't know whether it'll get renewed or not. So, if I am a taxi driver, a taxi owner, permit holder, I want to go and buy a new vehicle, normally the bank gives me a loan, it's for five years. Why should I invest in a vehicle for five years when my taxi permit is only for three years? That's why you see a lot of old taxis running around because nobody wants to buy a new vehicle. Of course, with the duty reduction, it's helped. So now, those taxi permits they get for 10 years, so I can invest. Those taxi permits now, I can buy and sell in the market. So I come to this lady here, so I've got a taxi permit, you want to buy it? How much you want to give it me? I can sell it to her. So overnight, I've got an asset. I can also, if I go to the bank, I can use my taxi permit as collateral, as mortgage. So if I don't do the loan repayment, the bank can seize my permit and auction it, or mortgage, mortgage sale it. So suddenly, you know, people will find a lot more investment going in, similarly we've done with many buses and also um, you know, the omnibuses, you know, the big buses. You see, those of you who live in Suva will complain that to travel at peak hour period from um, Nasino to Suva can take you an hour and a half. A lot more cars. Cars have tripled in Fiji, the number of cars. You see cars everywhere. If you actually sit there and do a survey, you'll find most of the people driving from Nasini to Suva, there's only one person in the car. But you know, it's seen as a sign of social mobility. People like to, oh, my son has a car. My daughter has a car. Because you know, to own a car is a sign of social mobility. So people like to own a car, but we need to have come to a stage where we need to make traveling by public transportation what I call sexy. The lawyers in my office who wear suits, you'll never see them on a bus. You know, how many people in a suit do you see on the bus? Because they're a lawyer. They won't catch the bus, they'll go in a taxi. Right? Because you don't catch the bus. But the same lawyers, if you go to Sydney, lawyers catch the bus, they catch the train, they catch the ferry. So, what we have to do, it's a, it's a three, four year program. We have to make public buses a lot more attractive. There's some buses that still has the, you know, the top line. <laughs> so, the guy say, I'm in a suit. I'm wearing my high heel. How am I going to go in the bus with the top line? So if you fix up the buses, then it becomes more attractive. Then, we'll have the four lane completed all the way from Nasori to Suva. You can then have dedicated bus lanes as you have overseas. When you go overseas in peak hour period, 6.30 a.m. till 9 a.m., this lane is only for buses. In some countries, they say only odd number cars can be driven on a day. So if I'm, I have an odd number car, my neighbor is an even number car, car, they jump in my car and we drive. Some countries have that. In New Delhi, you can't drive trucks during the day in the city precincts. You only come, can come at night with too much emission, you know, diesel or whatever. So people come up with new programs. So for us, we need to Im improve the quality of the public transportation. So it's a three, four year program. So these are some of the reasons why we're making these changes. Our next one, please. I mean, new parts for motor vehicle, reduce the duty, uh, new engines, hybrid batteries, energy bars, sardines. Uh, we've huge focus. Last few budgets, we've been reducing the duty for babies. You know, anything to do with babies. We have got a young population. Remember, 69.4% of the population is below the age of 40. So obviously a lot more productive in more ways than one. So they'll have more babies. So we need to make it more attractive for them to be able to buy good things for their babies. I mean, these are the kind of changes that we are, we are making and, and doing so. Um, and also the other things. Next one. Is that it? That's it? I mean, this is just for the tourism sector. Uh, TVET training activities, you'll be interested to know. Next one, please. Microphones and all of that. Towels, because we want some places you go now, when you buy a towel, you wipe yourself, the water stays there, but the towel just slides off. The quality, you know, we want to improve people's lives, the quality of their lives. So these are the kind of things we've been sort of changing around. And of course, uh, tobacco and alcohol always goes up. Uh, it's gone up by 15% again. And also these uh, sweetened and carbonated drinks. 
you can get all this information on this website please go to that because in fact what we did was this year we also as last year we've got a flyer on each ministry the major expenditure so you can actually print it out so if you're doing some you know with your students you're doing some work you can print out the flyers so it's got the budget estimates I don't have the budget it's a big thick book that shows the expenditure that's my budget address there's a supplement the budget flyers it also has for example a flyer for water authority Fiji exactly where which village which community will get how many water tanks it's all listed there where will the electricity get connected to so you'll have you know some Ulal's house will get connected where will the house is everything is stipulated there so you'll know exactly where the electricity grid is going to all of that is information is there and the right of reply um, the, unfortunately the economy team thought it not fit for me to present to you um, some of the other information that I normally present and one of the major issues is that what are the areas of the economy that contribute to our growth at the moment uh, agriculture is about uh, 30 percent fisheries and forest is about 0.1 percent uh, sorry because it's 0, uh, is uh, 0.32 fisheries and forests are only about 0.01 percent oh here we go oh here we go I didn't know we had that sorry. there you go these are the growth so you can see agriculture is about 0.34 agriculture fisheries and forestry is very very low There's a lot of potential there manufacturing is quite large construction like I mentioned 0.44 electricity water mining this area we believe actually has a lot of scope for us now as a government our policy is to expand the different areas the range of areas that contribute to economic growth if we're simply dependent on tourism and say sugar if you get a cyclone we were very lucky actually because when cyclone Winston came notwithstanding all the damage it did not damage majority of the hotel areas the hotel properties if it had had we would have been a much worse situation situation so if you get a cyclone and if you have more different types of areas that contribute to the economy you can bounce back a lot quicker but if you depend on only one or two things if that gets damaged you're finished you go back 50 years in terms of your development your ability to raise money gets limited the IT area has got huge growth ICT like I said 69.4 percent of the population below the age of 40 there was a South African company that set up a call center in Fiji called mine Pearl when they came in a few years ago we actually gave them an incentive every time they paid somebody's salary at the end of the year we gave them a rebate just to employ people now I asked them I said why have you come to Fiji and they told me certain things that I did not know about one of them they said that the time zone in Fiji is very good is exactly 12, 12 hours behind Greenwich Mean Time so the timing is good because you know, as you know call centers they answer calls from people from all different parts of the world so they service different clients the other thing they said is that uh, we we speak English well but more importantly well they said we have a younger population they said our accents are neutral I did not know this apparently our accents are neutral so when they go and set up call centers in India and Philippines they literally spend millions of dollars to get those Indians and those Filipinos to change the accent so an American can understand them whereas with us when our people speak on the phone an American an Australian or a Brit can understand us a lot quicker uh, we do not know this I just met a gentleman uh, three weeks ago they've set up a call center in uh, what used to be called Dominion House you know in, in Suva and the reason why they're doing that is because they believe that we have got a well-educated workforce so our challenge is of course to attract a lot better people so our job is to expand the economic base of the economy we want to grow this more we want this area to grow more too you can see finance is contributing quite significantly this is why we talk about hubbing Fiji Airways now flies to San Francisco LA Hong Kong Singapore Australia New Zealand and as I say when I go around talking to investors that Fiji Airways flies to every single continent that rims the Pacific Ocean except South America so the level of connectivity is good the Honorable PM is next week signing a agreement a host country agreement with the World Bank they are setting up a regional office in Fiji 
They'll be bringing in, you know, obviously experts, consultants. They'll be start off with 23 people. Those people will come on to rent homes, hire people to work for them, hire local people. More people will fly to Fiji to do consulting, so it improves. So this is why you have the services sector that improves. And at the moment, we're doing a working on a public-private partnership with hospitals too. Is that it? Okay, inflation, very important. As you know, inflation varies. This is the cost of goods rising. You can see we've kept inflation to 2% or below. There's a spike here because of Cyclone Winston. Yangona still today costs $120 a kilo in certain parts of Fiji, but people still drink it at the same rate. <laughs> a bundle of beans costs $5 after Winston. Small bunch of bananas in Suva cost 20 bucks. But of course that is coming down now. Beans are now being sold, they know, a dollar bundle or whatever it is. So currently, inflation is fluctuating around about 2%. But these are the things that have an impact on inflation. This is very important, ladies and gentlemen, foreign reserves. Nearly everything that we have, I'm holding this mic, is not made in Fiji. I'm wearing these shoes, it's not made in Fiji. The plastic chairs you are sitting on, maybe the mold is in Fiji, but the plastic comes from overseas. This fan comes from overseas. The lights come from overseas. The watch this lady is wearing comes from overseas. The gel she's using in her hair comes from overseas. <laughs> the earring is, comes from overseas. So we have to trade. When these people trade with us, when we buy these goods and services, they don't sell it to us in Fijian dollars. They sell it in US dollars, Japanese yen, euros, Australian dollars, New Zealand dollars. So we need to have foreign reserves. Now, a foreign reserve is actually generally a lot of people say, if your foreign reserves are very low, they say this country is going bankrupt because it cannot trade with other countries. Now, the international benchmark is this mark here. This is the number of months. So they say you must have at least four months' worth of foreign reserves to be seen as stable. Just the international benchmark. You can see where we were in 2005. $549 million, 2.3 months' worth of foreign reserves. Today, we are sitting at $2.3 billion worth of foreign reserves and sitting at 5.8 months of foreign reserves. You can see how it's fluctuating. Even though it's 1.9, it's 5.9 months, 5.8, 2.3, because a lot more people are buying. We are spending a lot more. You go to Nakasi on a Saturday, you see how people are spending money. At Roop's uh, new place. There's so much spending going on, and most of the money that we are spending on, a lot of the stuff we buy are actually foreign made. So the foreign reserves, and again, when, you're, when our foreign reserves are high, when we go and negotiate to borrow money, or when Fiji Airways goes and buys planes, when they you know, negotiate with a banker from overseas, they look at this. So they can get better interest rates when your foreign reserves are high because they know that these people can actually pay for it. And they have the currency to pay for it. Oh. Funding for higher education. Yeah, but, oh, sorry, this is the, uh, the FNU specifically. Uh, USP is there, University of Fiji. This is the capital grant to FNU. Capital grant to FNU. Uh, FNU Lambasa campus, six million. FNU Pacifica Dental Clinic, Nasinu campus, Maritime Academy, Bat Labs, hospitals, etc. Uh, so uh, that's that's overall for that uh, grant. This is the tells one. If you want that information, you can get it. But this shows how much the students will now get. So before they were getting 433, now they get 6,600 semester student. Uh, trimester based students will receive $7,000 instead of $5,700 a trimester. Um, we now no longer require guarantors. Those of you may be in high schools. So we tell students now we no longer require guarantors. So irrespective of whatever income level, they can get the tells as long as they get a place in university. But we do require students when they go overseas to give some form of surety. We've had some students who've done TELS, they've got their qualifications and they've taken off. They've migrated. So obviously we don't want that. So we don't need guarantors, but if people are going overseas, we need some form of surety for that. And as I said, they can upgrade. So if I start off with a certificate or diploma, 
I can continue to get tells until I finish my degree. We don't give it for postgrad at the moment, something we are you know, looking at in the future. Next one, please. This is the new one we've given. It's a startup allowance of $300. For those students who come from low income families, when they finish their degree, we'll give them $300 for startup. So, assuming I'm a student, I'm from Lambasa, I need to come for a job interview to Suva. They may not have enough money for the you know, bus fare or the ferry fare or whatever it is. Or I may want to go for my job interview, I don't have a suit. So you give them some money. This is a startup for them. As I said to the students at USP the other day, we may give you the $300, you may go and drink beer and finish it all off in one night and have a big party. That's the level of responsibility they need to have, but we're investing only $300 on, in, in them. But after they finish the degree. Um, yep, that's it. That's it. And we just started one new program that you need to understand, which is called YES, which is the Youth Entrepreneurship Scheme. If anybody, a student's group of finish, a students finish their degree, they've got a nice idea, they've got a new idea for business innovation. We've got a team of private sector people, they're headed by the, chaired by the CEO of ANZ. Well, they'll assess them and they can give them grants up to $20,000 to start up their new business. I don't know how many of you know, but the M-Pesa, the program was actually written by a young man from Vanuelevu. So there are many young people out there who may actually, we want to encourage them to become entrepreneurs. So we don't want them to just become what we call job seekers, we want them to become job creators also. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, that's the budget. If you have any questions, let me know. But please feel free, I understand they've arranged lunch for you uh, in takeaway containers, which is also made overseas, it's not made in Fiji, <laughs> if you pay for. But uh, thank you very much for coming uh, today. I hope that provides clarification uh, to many of the issues that were highlighted in the public space. But we've given you the email address. Maybe if you can put that up again, Bernie. If you have any issues, please email them to us. We'll address them to you. Please also tell your colleagues. We are in um, uh, Singatoga tomorrow morning and Nasori tomorrow afternoon. And then we are in uh, the next day. We are in uh, Nandi in the morning, Latoka midday, Ba in the afternoon then Savu Savu and Lambasa on Friday. Thank you very much and I wish you a good day. Vinaka.